Could put the microphone to it. Now that you've given it to me, I can tell you I don't deserve it. Yeah. What time did you go to bed last night? This past night, Friday. I said it last night. Oh, that's better. Yeah. Here we go. Okay, we saw the joke. Let's go forward here. So this is Paul. When he was about four years old, what, Paul? Well, don't you want to show the picture, the thing that you just did, and then you got the sound, and now they can get the whole thing together? No, we, we, we heard enough of it. Everyone knows this is your life. Did you see who was in the picture? Yeah, they saw it. We don't need to repeat. It's a joke. It's done. It's good Paul doesn't have control of the microphone. We'd be here for about five hours. Yeah, it could be a long time. So this is Paul back in North Dakota in the war years, we call it. 1943, 44, and he says uh, that all these years he's, he's actually got a name for this photo, Saving the World for Democracy. This is the backyard of the parsonage for the Dorpath family. My dad was a Lutheran preacher. We go now to Paul as the baby of the family. Of course, there's the baby sitting on his older brother's lap. And in our first now and then, we're going to see Paul with his brothers in a photo I took about 15 years ago. And Paul is the last remaining of this generation of Dorpats. And there is Ted, his older brother. Here's Paul with his dad. The Reverend Dorpat and his mom, Cherry. That's my mom. I was told by one of... No. I was told by one of Paul's uh, father's parishioners that Paul's voice sounds exactly like his father's. My dad was famous as a rhetorician, as a speaker for the church. However, he was very good at it. Very, very good at it. He didn't have much to say, though. He didn't convince you. I think that was his greatest failure. By the, by the I liked him a lot. Don't get this wrong. Like Mid-late 60s, Paul loved his dad. By the mid-late 60s, Paul had founded and was editing the Helix, the underground newspaper in Seattle. I was about 10 years old at the time. I remember deeply offending my parents with Walt Crowley's nudes, which I put on my wall. That was an exciting time. Anything that was, that was he did do that. He did these. Look at there. There's a Walt Crowley example here. And of course, the the helix led to some other remarkable events. That's right. The Times did a special piece about it. Did anyone go to Sky River? Sky River. Really? Oh, good. Good to see you again. Now we have offered. If you look forward here, we're going to jump forward and we'll see a couple slides from Sky River. There's Paul with Tom Robbins in his saffron robes. Were you a Buddhist then? No, I, I wasn't. Somebody gave that to me and I, I was looking for some way to get rid of it. Uh, interesting story. I went to a Unitarian Council convention at the Olympic Four Seasons Hotel and that was the last time I wore it. It's too embarrassed to be among those New Englanders wearing the saffron robe. 
Well, here are some happy uh, festival attendees. Yeah. That was uh, the first day I remember. And it was mostly a muddy festival, but the sun came out momentarily. Now, who was at that festival? Who experienced the mud? Was anyone here at the first Sky River? So, but you aren't in the, in the picture here. It's not that I would admit. <laughs> what did you say? I said not that I would admit it. Oh, that you admit it. I don't know. Why, why did you say that? <laughs> Your husband. <laughs> He's been nice to me. Uh, well, within about 10 years, Paul was had launched as a as a public historian, and one of his first and most successful publications was 294 glimpses of historic Seattle, which appeared only a few months before the Seattle Times column began. And so here's a glimpse of those glimpses. And Paul, they were distinguished in in to some extent because Paul sold them for very cleverly 294 cents. Penny a picture. Penny and picture, and we didn't keep any of the money. It went to the mayor's small business task force. So it all came out of the city hall. Go ahead. I don't know how I ever made money, frankly, in my life. We're all still charitable things. You depended on the kindness of strangers. Who's that from? Uh, Shakespeare. That's right. <laughs> Via Tennessee Williams. And here's Paul with his mentor, Murray Morgan. You guys remember Murray? Red is Skid Row. Well, it's highly recommended that you use a map and read that Skid Row. It's a history of Seattle. And it's written so well, it's so enjoyable to read. Yeah. Uh, okay, Skid Row. And they just reprinted it. It's never been out of print since they first printed it over 150 years ago. They just reprinted it. It's never been out of print. This is a lovely picture of Paul with a uh, Lucy Campbell Coe. Uh, and in his career as a historian, he would often spend time with people who remembered things. And Lucy remembered when she was only a toddler, standing on the hill looking down at the Seattle fire. Yeah, you know, it's about four different old timers that I met in the first months of my research. Because when I went, I was out looking for old timers then, and there were still a few around. So, yeah, I met a lot of people that, well, four people that had seen the fire as kids, as children. We jump forward now to 2011, where Paul and I, with our friend Berenger Lamont, did a show at Mohai, uh, in which they gave us a big room and all the wall space we needed to do uh, a Seattle now and then combined in a Washington State now and then combined with the Paris now and then. Berenger took the photos of Paris in the foreground, including one of the oldest photo of a human and a city, the oldest photo, which was of from Daguerre's studio window looking across Place de la Concorde in Paris. That's all true. <laughs> and Berenger took this photo of us, and here are the three of us standing outside there. And uh, this is from 2011, well about six years before Paul and I went to Paris and I took a little video of a moment which, which I think is kind of delightful and you'll hear in, from the speaker just the sound of me snorting and a, and a couple comments from Paul. Oh, wait a second, wait a second. I started, it was my camera and I took the first pictures of uh, the doppelganger and then you took it out of my hands and I went up to sit next to the doppelganger, right? Not quite, but it was your camera. Are you sure I didn't give you the camera to hold it while I went up there? You did give it to me, but you didn't take the first pictures because I, I have the entire thing on film right here. We can look at it. Let's take a look. I think he's mistaken. Well, I can prove it. Here we go. <laughs> oh, is that you, Paul?
So Berenger sends him back so that she can take a, an actual photo. And here's Beringer's photo of that moment with the two of them. She went back about five years later and she actually found the guy who is a Romanian Orthodox priest. And here he is standing in his church. But it was a sort of a magnificent moment. And you're correct, Paul. You, you were holding the camera when I first looked at it. But I was the one who saw it. I think that's it. Okay, here we go. Sit next to him. Yeah. So we all agreed that was a perfect. Well, your, your act is more, certainly more important than my sort of dull notion. All right, so now we're going to start the book. <laughs> I do, because I want to move this along. This is Paul's very first column, January 17th, 1982. And these are the, this is this welcome home of the 63rd Coast Artillery in 1919. And uh, the whole city turned out. They were delighted to, uh, to bring the boys home from the First World War. And uh, we return. I went back on a significant date. And one of my responsibilities is to find a way to take a photograph that somehow gives at least a comment upon or emphasis to uh, a street corner or, a, or an event. So I decided to go back on the 21st of January 2017, and we found the largest march in Seattle history at the same spot, which is at the corner of Pike and West Lake, and Pike and Fourth. How many of you were in the march? One, two, three, two, four, five, three impressions. This is Paul's original photograph. This is Paul's original photograph that he took in the fall of 81. And uh, you can see that he has the barista, the very first column in the Times, the barista here is holding the photograph that appeared next to her in the paper. I have her name, but I forgot it. And this is our first column that we show in the book. The book is comprised of about 100 subjects, which we've taken from the 1800 columns. And this, uh, and we do them chronologically. So the first column is, that Paul did is the first one in the book, and we proceed through uh, even a couple in 2018. So let's go forward. We've chosen a few to show you and share with you tonight. Ooh, Seattle's deepest snow. And sometimes we can repeat, and sometimes it's more difficult because it hasn't been snowing very much in Seattle. I think the last big snow overturned uh, a mayor, but uh, but the closest we could get to this 1880. Yes, he was. He felt the tragedy himself. He did feel the tragedy. 1880 was when this snow fell, and uh, in about eight days, starting on January 4th. 64 inches of snow fell. So this is First and Cherry looking up the hill. And here it is today. And this is the last <laughs> snowfall I could capture in 2017. I love your snowfall. Do you know that anybody criticizes I won't. Here's a lovely shot of the waterfront from the 90s, 1890s taken by Anders Vilso, the Norwegian photographer. Uh, you can see uh, the ice plant sprawling down on the, on the front of the waterfront and, and the smoke rising up out of the chimneys and it reminds me of the old phrase from uh, in early industrial age where the industrialists would sit in their mansions on the hill and look down and watch the smoke and say, muck is money. 
So Anders Felsa was a magnificent, uh, was a treasure of Norway. He was here for less than a decade, and then he went back to Norway, where he became uh, Norway's great national photographer. And through, until about 1940, he was he was a force to be reckoned with. Let's look at today. These are a few of my elementary school students dancing at the fountain in about the same spot. Another Anders Vilsa of the waterfront. This is the Yukon. Uh, no, this is not the Yukon. This is this is the waterfront in the in during the gold rush, and uh, it's probably 1898. Could be 1899. During the gold rush, this little two-block stretch was uh, uh, was a bit of an oddity. The docks were stubby, and the services were mostly local. And in the 99 days during the late winter and spring of 1898. 107 ships sailed for the Klondike, most of them right from these docks. And today, the Marion Street pedestrian overpass. Makes you wonder how many uh, aluminum uh, huts they had on board. <laughs> yeah, let's take a look back. You can actually see the sign for aluminum houses with a weight 150 pounds. And those pictures of long lines in Chapman and the Gold Rush of men climbing up the, the mountainside, some of them were carrying those, those wooden huts, those aluminum huts. When Vilsa got back to Norway, uh, he took many thousands of photos, and uh, they actually honored him with a the stamp collection of Vilsa photographs. And uh, they're quite, quite magnificent. His portraits of people are also lovely, but I just, I found this one kind of wonderful. Uh, he had intended to come back to Seattle. His wife had gone before him to visit the families in Norway. Then once she got there, she wrote him not a Dear John letter, but a Dear... Anders. Huh? Dear Anders. Uh, no, dear Anders letter. Uh, you come home to home. And that's where you're staying. You're coming back here. And he obeyed her. So he moved back to Norway. That's right. Happy wife. Well, let's take a look here. This was taken from the chest, the structure of the Smith Tower where, where it was just completed. The final rivets had, had been punctured uh, into its steel skeleton. It was topped off and with about 42 stories attached. Everyone could imagine a trip to the top. However, only a few like Frank Noel, the Webster and Stevens photographer, made it up there before the skin was applied and he's shooting through the, the structure. And uh, you can see what he saw. And this is the first time anyone had seen Queen Anne and Lake Union and Wallingford from this location. What about the empty square? Ooh, the empty square. That, that became. Well, I've got to turn around now. Okay, well, I haven't got these pictures memorized. Okay, which one? This, this the square. That's the old uh, Rainier Hotel built right after the fire to, to you know, take care of all the people rushing in to rebuild the city. And that did its work oh, in, into the 90s until finally that hotel moved down up to First Avenue, uh, where the Federal Building is now, that is between. Uh, um, you know, the two ones that start with them, Marion and Madison. I think he's talking about the empty space right yeah, here. I know, that's what I'm talking about. That's the hotel? That was where the hotel was. Oh, okay. So here it's torn down. It was for a while at the dormitory for nurses before it was torn down. So it has a kind of spotty history. But there's a lot of good pictures of it. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't bring one. You know, that, that, there's actually a story associated with that where I went down on Fifth Avenue oh, yes. and tried to shoot those nurses across this stretch of land standing below the, the, the hospital. And what was amazing was it's, it was a bank lobby and I'm standing on Fifth Avenue. And the security guard came out and told me that I was not allowed to stand on the sidewalk and take photographs. This was maybe 2008. Fear is connected with terrorism. It's a kind of fear that's sometimes used by 
by politicians to reign control over the idiots who voted for them. <laughs> Well, the security guard had signed on to this, and, and we, we had a little, uh, uh, a little tete-a-tete -tete standing there, and I said, well, please do call the police. I'd like to talk to them. And, and, but he, he, so he walked away cursing me, and I took the photo. He never used it, but I just remembered that as being, because there were people that were arrested for taking photos uh, around town. In Seattle. In Seattle, there was a, there was a professor of, of Arche I think she was an archaeologist or a, uh, what was she like? I don't know. It was Pushy University of Washington. Pushy University of Washington Props, and she had architecture, and she was taking pictures of power lines for, uh, for a seminar, and they came and arrested her and put her in the back of the squad car. This was in Seattle. You know, the funny thing about this picture is, Dean, that I gave you misinformation. Remember we discovered that? I was a block off. So the picture that you took, wasn't even in the right place. It's one of yes. the rare, yeah. Not this one, but the, the one where I was confronted. So, I want you to look now. This is a really nice projector. Congrats to the Duwamish uh, Longhouse here. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's very nice. So, let's, yeah, I think it's an Epson. That's First United Methodist, and right next to it, of course, is well, watch the Rainier Club and look for Lake Union. So you, you'll, you'll make out the Rainier Club. I've, I've centered it in our modern photo, because of course I went up to the top of Smith Tower and, and reshot. So let's take a look. Can you hear me up there? Oh my God. Let's do it again. So keep your eyes on the Rainier Club, and that gives you a point of focus. No more Lake Union. This is the Monongahela escaping through the almost completed Aurora Bridge. And uh, it had been in Lake Union for several years, uh, undergoing, or just being stored, just being a, a foremaster was become pretty useless. As after it came out from under the, under the bridge, just before the completion of the bridge, it uh, it was sold to the Kelly Logging Company in Vancouver and survived a few more years hauling logs before being scrapped. And here the bridge is today. And let's go forward now. We're going to go on the top of the bridge. But before we go there, I'm going to tell you a little story about this telegraph key, which is called the Taft Key. And it was studded with gold nuggets from the, the Yukon uh, and given to President Taft uh, for the opening of AYP. So the first Seattle World's Fair was opened by Taft when he pressed this button in DC and sent the message to begin the opening ceremonies. Well, it was also used to open the George Washington Memorial Bridge by Herbert Hoover on February 22nd, 1932, the 200th anniversary of George Washington's birth. And the professor, the, the, the governor, Roland Hartley at the time, was a fierce opponent of the bridge and had spoken against it and, and levied against it for, for uh, before its construction for a long time. And Paul thinks, Paul has a theory why he did so. Uh, he was from Everett. <laughs> I think that, that might be cool. But anyway, Roland Hartley was from Everett. He did not like the, the notion of a bridge. But you, as you can see, it, it, there were quite a few fans on opening day. He fought anything that had to do with Seattle. That, uh, because Seattle was not where he got his votes. It's like the current presidency. You know, that's all pretty much rural, not urban. So he didn't like, uh, he didn't like Seattle. Interestingly, as seeing the crowds, and the, the, he decided to, to, uh, to become a self-promoter, and, and he del was delivering a very long speech about the glories of this bridge, which he had opposed. 
for its construction. He's also an opportunist. He was a bit of an opportunist. We don't have politicians like that today. But <laughs> back in 32, it was, a, it was a tough time. So Roland Hartley was, was, was uh, pontificating and bloviating, and at 2.57 that afternoon, Herbert Hoover held the tapped key on his desk, and he punched the key to start the festivities, and it cut off Roland Hartley, uh, and the, the crowd streamed out from both sides. The fireboats shot off their, their plumes of water from below. Fireworks went off, and the flags dropped down, and it was a very exciting time. And the crowds cheering poured onto the bridge, and Roland never finished his speech. Best thing about Roland uh, is his first name. Roland's a lovely name. I like Roland. That was my, that was my grandfather's middle name. Well, let's go forward. The things we learn, and here we are today. And occasionally, when when you see an elevated shot and there's nothing elevated around me, I have to use my 21 foot long extension pole to He's get up. Six foot five, six foot high, six foot five inches tall, and maybe half an inch. And then you got your shoes, and you got your tippy toes, so he can get up there. And then he has a pole that goes over 20 feet. Is that right, Jane? You've got it in one. So he can get up to the third floor. In fact, I wrote a story last night that was a completely unique photograph. I've never seen anything like it before. It's a picture of First Hill taken from the roof of the uh, city county building, or the city court, the county courthouse, that block square, you know, that's still there, but now it's eight stories higher. And he got, uh, 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 he couldn't get up there because it's now eight stories taller. So he used that, uh, he used that uh, pole of his and his own considerable height, his, his uh, statuary, his, his statuesque qualities. Okay, Jim. Well, thank you, Paul. So here we have Mr. Uh, Hoover uh, pressing the key just to open the, the George Washington Memorial Bridge. And of course, it was used once more at least, in connection with Seattle. I think this was the last time it was used. And you might be able to guess which World's Fair was opened by John F. Kennedy using the Taft Key once again. Still studded with gold, and I think it's in the Smithsonian right now. But as we go forward, we're going to visit another column in the book, and this is young Paula Dahl, who, at six years old, was acclaimed as the nine millionth visitor to the fair. And you can see the dog she won. Her parents delighted and her very unhappy sister. <laughs> Paul is now an elementary school teacher in Issaquah. And here she is standing. And in her classroom on the wall, she has that nine millionth sign to this day. And what surprised us, who would have imagined that it was yellow? This, the color of the sun. It's a yellow sun. I, I just thought of it just now. I wouldn't have looked at that original photo of that yellow. Yeah. It's called an excited utterance. What's that? It's called an excited utterance. An excited utterance. Rhonda says I just had an excited utterance. <laughs> and she, Rhonda's one of the three sisters who is, appears in the book. And they're all from the Northwest. They, they're, uh, Ronnie just showed up, in fact, with pictures of, of her grandmother, which I'm already familiar with because we did a story about her, and that's why it's in the book. She and her two sisters. And a fire hydrant, which they refer to as their brother. <laughs> it's in the book. So that's we now book. proceed to. Did you put the fire hydrant in the, in the contemporary one that you shot recently? Yep. Yes. yes. Okay. It's in the book. It's in the book. And you guys remember that? In the book. Who did that? I don't remember his name. Clay will remember. Clay? He doesn't remember. That's something Clay normally would know. So here we are, and this is one of the rare photographs of the start of the Seattle fire. You have the big crowds gathering, looking down First Avenue. The cross street is spring. And up here, you can see a rather amazing, there's one guy standing on top of the Fry Opera House looking down. And, uh, but, and no one died. And so today, uh, and Paul guesses that 
perhaps the photographers who would have been shooting pictures were evacuating their businesses, grabbing their equipment, taking cameras out and slides and film and everything they had to get away from the fire, because many of them were downtown here. But all of these buildings disappeared along with 30 more blocks. And here we are looking at first and spring today, again with a 21-foot pole. Did you mention that they're totally acceptable for them to interrupt the talk and talk, ask questions at the beginning, didn't you? But you can, you're supposed to do that. If you want to ask a question, interrupt. If you have a question, feel free to interrupt. Just wave at Paul and happily. What happened to the slide we used to have at the beginning of the show? Well, I used to put a slide at the beginning of the show which says, please don't interrupt and make fun of that slide. But there was a point at which during, we've done about seven or eight of these now, and it began to be that the entire show would go on for an extra hour because people would take us, you know, they just assumed that it was time. There was one guy up in the Century Club who just wanted to talk about Seattle hockey history, and that went on for 15 minutes. That was when I removed the slide, Paul. I don't know. You have to have the power to control these people, Gene. <laughs> and who do you think was, was giving over to Seattle hockey history? Who was it? Let's go forward. Well, this is a couple days after that last. <laughs> See Paul after the show. <laughs> so here we are, a couple days after the fire. And this is... Uh, this is pretty emblematic in a number of ways. The, in, a, in the book, this is called after the, 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 the newspaper's uh, description, The Hideous Remains. What was that building? We're gonna find out. Let's look at it today. So you'll look past the current photo, or through the current photo, and you will see, okay, there we go, let's point at it. You see the front of the sinking ship garage here? Well, that was once the front of the Occidental Hotel. And the Seattle Hotel. And, the, and then rebuilt as the Seattle Hotel. So let's go forward now. You can see the sinking ship garage. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more as we look at it from down the street. There's the Seattle Hotel, which replaced. This is 1908. So this is 20 years after the fire. The Seattle hockey team's visitors would stay. Would be in that hotel. All right. I remember I, we were talking about this. Yeah. Okay. So there we have the Seattle Hotel, and of course today, from 1908 to today, we have a, a a sensitive replacement, not the Smith Tower, which you're about to see, but of course the sinking ship garage, which was built on the same footprint as the Seattle Hotel. Let's watch that transformation one more time. One belongs. You remember that song, one of, the, one of these things is not like the other? Well, there we have. But there is an element here. There's a couple elements. One, Paul is going to lead us through an evaluation of the sinking ship garage. Paul, can you talk about this? Well, gee, thank you. Uh, there, and we can talk about any other subject you'd like, but let's stick to Gene's uh, itinerary here and talk about the basket-shaped, basket-handle-shaped windows in the merchants uh, across the street. See that? Oh, yeah. Gene's pointing it out. Now, the people that put together uh, this garage got a lot of criticism from the fledgling preservationists, as Gene, as Gene will describe in a moment. So they said, well, listen, we're going to take your sensitivity in, into concern here, and we're going to make um, qualities to the garage that repeat those that are in the uh, post-fire environment of, of the, you know, the Romanesque neighborhood. So uh, there, that's what they did. They put, they twisted the pipes so they too would be basket handle shaped, and you can see it here. So that's the point, Gene. Thank you so much. So we compliment the sensitivities of the architects who created our, our lovely sinking ship garage. And of course, the loss of the Seattle Hotel inspired one Victor Steinbrook. Yeah, so from the early 60s to the late 60s, when another great Seattle institution was threatened, the Pike Place Market, Victor led the charge to save it. And a, a group of thousands of preservationists then 
literally took to the streets to save the market. We actually have a photo of Victor marching in front of City Hall with a Save the Market uh, placard. And uh, fortunately, we did. Even though then, the then mayor, who was not from Everett, wanted to get rid of it. And we won't name him Whistle. And, but he was not a fan of the bike place market, wanted to replace it with cleaner, uh, nicer structures, like oh, hotels. Wes is fine, Wes is fine. Oh, he's a fine, fine guy, but he was just... I say that uh, Snyder uh, let me drive his car around the block. Wes did? No, no, that's a mark in his favor. Well, you know, that's... Asked me what kind of car it was. What kind of car was it? It wasn't a Rolls Royce, but it was the next in line from the Rolls Royce in a British car. What would that be? What? Was it Bentley? Huh? A Bentley? A Bentley, right. Yeah. Yeah, drove around the block. So once around the block with Wes and his Bentley. You would have been a, you just let me drive it. <laughs> no. He stopped at the Helix and went inside and I was going out and said, by the way, could I drive your Bentley? And he said, sure. He gave me the keys and, and I drove it around the block. Nice car, really. Have you ever driven a Bentley? I never have. Very good people have. This was the market in 1907, and there are no Bentleys in this photo, but there might be in the following, which was taken earlier this year. And there's our lovely market, looking right down the street. It's a lovely picture, Gene. Oh, thank you. Now, where is this? Some of you may know if you've been following Paul's column, because this appeared about two years ago. Some of you may have an inkling. Maybe they missed this one. Well, there's 52, 51 columns a year, generally. I don't know. The Times always has one issue they reserve for their own purposes. That must be. So this was taken by a Boeing engineer named Werner Lingenhager in the mid-50s. That's your first clue. Why would he take a muddy street alleyway in the mid-50s. Second clue. Use your head. Melrose Place. The name, of the street. Oh. name of the street. Melrose Place. Third clue. Oh, wow. So Werner knew that the freeway was coming. And they were, they hadn't yet dug the ditch, but he snapped in both directions. And you'll see both of these in the book. And it's really uh, one of the greatest transformations, just from that little ditch, that alley, to, to an enormous freeway. Let me interrupt and say that Gene's work in this book, that is the contemporary photos, which he took two and a half years to complete, looking for the right weather and, you know, and all of that, is brilliant and a great testimony to the growing city, the one we know. And you should buy the book for that, if nothing else. By two copies. Okay. Well, it's all, and, and I'm, I'm, as we go forward, I'm going to say that it's also the story of Paul's subjective, but that already came from the beginning. no, I didn't. I didn't. I think there's something more interesting. I think it's 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 one man's vision of, of a city because these are the subjects that he chose. Uh, many of them came to him but he specifically chose and wrote about, and he personalizes the history in a way, as you all know. Did he have a pain for me as visions? I think so, I think so, I think you were a visionary. So here we are at the post office, and these were the post office steps. And if you were, an, we decided an Edwardian, and you were walking with your hat and your, your hoop skirts, and you said, meet me at the steps, this is where you would, you would meet your friends. I think it was torn down in 58. Who remembers the, the old post office? You remember it? Go back. I was waiting for the, the next event here, right? Uh, you? Up on the high stool there? Uh, what was the question? Are you waiting for the next event? No, I'm, I'm enjoying this one. Well, you know, that reminds me of a sauna. <laughs> <laughs> He says it reminds him of a sauna. It could be a little warmer. I know you're about four feet up. 
So the reason they, they decided to tear down the post office and its steps and those gorgeous columns, all made of chuckanut sandstone, was because of pigeons. And pigeons gathered and pooped on those steps and discolored them over the decades. And so the, the, uh, the clever and, and wise city fathers decided, they were fathers, not mothers, they decided to replace with another beautiful structure, which would not be affected by pigeon crap. And here we look at it now, at the corner of Third and Union, our lovely aluminum box. No one says, meet me at the box these days. Yeah, I want to say something about his description of the reason that they gave up on the thing of the discoloration. He is, and I've watched him keeping a statistic this on, on how he describes that. And half the time he says that it gets discolored. The other time, half of the times, he says pigeon poop. <laughs> so you see there is a kind of tension in him about whether to use the word poop. So let's invite him now to say it five times in a row and get rid of this silly fear. <laughs> You know, it's actually, I, it depends on the audience. What did I say, Paul? Did I say poop or did I say no, crap? No, I didn't use poop. I said crap. Was that on the I could have said pigeon shit, but I thought that could have been. <laughs> Sorry. So we go forward. Ah, Hooverville. 250 of the 500 little shacks in the, in the mid 30s. It was taken from the B.F. Goodrich building, and I went back, and the Port of Seattle allowed me to go up on a lift, and I got about 30, 40 feet in the air, because there is no B.F. Goodrich building today. And we found that, just watch the Smith Tower once again, which is, we're looking for, for our consistent symbols. And here we go. That's about the same spot. Oh, and this is one of the, uh, one of the final runs of, uh, within the last few months of the Fremont streetcar. We were instructed never to say trolley by the motormen uh, who are fans of historical vehicles. Why don't they like trolley? <laughs> they said they, they thought that, that many people confused like the waterfront trolley was confusing that people would think they were talking about another incarnation. But there's also it, the South Lake Union trolley. Right. So we have trolleys today. Oh, is that now? That's now? why you're there. Now the South, yeah, the okay. SWAT, the South Lake Union trolley. Yeah. Did it? Well, these motormen were insisting to us that whenever we said, "Well, this is the last Fremont trolley," they said, "Don't call it a trolley. Call it a streetcar." So I go back and forth. I like trolley. It makes me feel happy just to say the word. It was a jolly era of trolleys. Well, this is the end of the jolly trolleys. It was. A, this is the end of the trolleys because, of course, this is about the same time in the early 40s when the uh, uh, when the uh, oil companies, the tire companies, and the the uh, gasoline engines replaced the trolley cars. And so, we went back to find a repeat. And of course, this is another significant event in Seattle history, and it happens every summer on that same corner. another uh, portion of the city which really has not changed. The International District remains much the same. What's kind of magnificent about, about this, uh, and one of my favorite repeats, is that I, I wandered around near the Hotel Milwaukee, uh, which is still the Hotel Milwaukee, so I wandered in this direction towards, towards the water and uh, towards west, and I found the Seattle Kung Fu Club where Sifu John Liang who has been the master there since 1960 and was a teacher of Bruce Lee, brought his entire club out into the street and indulged us with a repeat. 
with all his lion dancers. Let's see if we can. And there they are. And it was fortunate. I was worried that they would be upset with us for taking over King for 10 minutes, but this guy is a West Seattle cop. He said, don't worry about it. <laughs> and here's uh, John Leon, who just turned 80 this year as well. And he's a, he is the, a testament to the efficacy and uh, health effects of Kung Fu. By the uh, hockey story. Is that why you're keeping you quiet so that you don't? Go ahead. No, we've, we've been interrupted a couple times. People just join in when they feel the urge. No, you, you have. You have. And the guy in the sauna back there. He's, he's, he's been involved. Yeah. We won't worry about it, Paul. Well, here we are. This is a story of loss, uh, not just for the citizens of Seattle, but for the actual citizens of the, of the region. Uh, the Duwamish tribe had a village for thousands of years along this river. And so some of you, I'll give you a little clue. Some of you may know what the name of the river is. The next slide will give you the name. The Black River. Black River. And when the, when, the, uh, when the water was lowered in Lake Washington, the river disappeared. Uh, it burbles up in a, in a culvert or two, and uh, down, there's a, there's a park down by, in Renton, where you can see... Port Dance. Yeah. Port Dance, you were there? No, I live nearby. It's about a, there's about a, a few hundred yard uh, stub left of the Black River there. Right. Well, the junction. The junction. Yep. So let's look at this, close to this location today, and you can see that not much of the river remains. It's South Rainier. And here uh, we have Lake Union looking southeast. And the Brown children, he became a Seattle cop. And was actually on the cover of one of Paul's first Seattle Now and Then books. First one, yeah, I, really, I was really owed it to them that I survived because those kids were so charming to the, uh, to the consumers that they bought thousands and thousands and thousands of of books. Uh, also, those books were kind of rare then. You didn't have many books on local history in, in the early 80s, even. That's when that first one came out. So I lived off of, uh, I was living in the life of Riley Jean. <laughs> I know. And so here we are seeing the brown children waiting in, on the shores of Lake Union. And as we built up Lake Union, we end up pushing pavement on concrete, and Westlake is beyond these girls who are my, the children of my neighbors. And we took this about uh, seven years ago for the Mohai show we did, and I went back with them earlier this year so we could see Tia and Liana all grown up. I have a question I'd like to ask you the group here. How many of you have uh, gone swimming in Lake Union? One, two, three? I fell out of the kayak. You fell off of the kayak. Did you okay? That'll count. Okay. How many of you have gone swimming in uh, the Duwamish River? One, two, so huh? Speak up. So I wasn't saying it was smart. Oh, you did it regardless. So it's sort of regular, but only two of you in the river. Okay. How many of you have eaten fish out of the Duwamish? How many of you got sick from eating fish? <laughs> I don't believe I've eaten, knowing we eat fish at all. Oh, there's somebody I talked to yesterday that got sick from eating fish out of the pond. Well, we return now to the Kalakala. Yes. Be careful. And this was the Kalakala's trip through the locks, from fresh to salt. And we've discussed this, and it may be that it was undergoing repairs in Lake Union and returning to the salt water, and hence the 
the crowd on the decks celebrating its return to the salt water. Look at those windows, filled. This is, I think, 47, 48. And of course, it was built in 35, and Paul guesses that it might have been built to alleviate the depression of the depression. I don't think it was capitalists were thinking of that. They were remaking the waterfront, and uh, they needed a, you know, a new flagship to go with their new Coleman dock, and as I said, it was all Art Deco. But it's true, it did relieve and fascinate and all of that. That wouldn't be their first. So yeah, you just contradicted yourself. Well, they all calculated it. It's all calculation money. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. okay. Conspiracy, then. Well, well, I went back to the locks and knew I had to get a, something to rival the Calacala, and unintentionally I, I found something of, of, of size, but I also found that it was, it was unique in that it was actually a, a boat with a very important history. This boat also, it's the USS Turner Joy, and the Turner Joy is over uh, a museum ship in Bremerton, and it was decommissioned in 1982, and its history is unique in the sense that it was one of the two boats involved in an incident off the coast of Vietnam called the Gulf of Tonkin. Yep. And uh, so the and I only discovered this that that little factoid is not in the book because I took this photo not knowing uh, that the Turner Joy was so significant. But it joined the USS Maddox. Uh, and there were two events. One of them was on August 2nd, 1964, in which the Maddox uh, exchanged fire with North Vietnamese gunboats. And then an event that actually did not occur by all contemporary accounts on, uh, two days later, which, but which Johnson used to get us into the war, the Gulf of Tonkin incident. So, we'll just lie about it. We'll just lie about it. The Turner Joy was, was there for both of those, the actual event and the non-event. And here it is at sea, off the coast of Vietnam. And now, Clay went back a couple days ago and took pictures off of, just up the street from us. And here's, uh, just, just next to Salty's, you can see the wheelhouse of the Kalakaba. And then he took a lovely shot looking through it. Oh, wait a second, let me see the lovely one. Isn't that lovely? I have actually historical photos right there. No, we can we can use them. Okay, uh, I think we're got, coming to the end here now. We're getting close. This is the, of course, April of 1953, the day before, uh, the days before the viaduct opened, and they let pedestrians walk on the viaduct. And within another a few days, the cars were streaming across. Someone pointed out that. Looking at this brand new viaduct, fresh poured concrete, it looked kind of tawdry and old even before <laughs> the cars were riding. It really is kind of kind of hideous. Are you talking about the viaduct? I am. Have, I you, am. Got, have you run this through Clay? I don't. I, yeah, Clay and I have. We we battled over this, and I'm one because I'm six foot five. <laughs> All right. Well, Clay is one of the great defenders of the viaduct, and, and sorely misses the thought already of losing it. And it's a wonderful view of the city. I think it's primarily the view thing. He doesn't like the smoking uh, from the, you know, the tailpipes or the, nor the noise or the, all of that either, but it's a view. Well, Clay also has spoken uh, as a West Seattleite. That's one of his, uh, it's one of, one of the places that he feels. Uh, it's, it's our lifeline, our just lifeline. like Ballard. Traffic, Paul. You don't drive. These guys have to drive. You don't live in West Seattle. I did. Well, they were by Bash on Island. What? Before the Bash on Island, I lived in West Not before the Bash We're just going to have to agree to disagree. You're in, a, you're in an unfriendly crowd here. You know, really, you're going to find out. Yeah. Okay. Let's hold off. You can, you can talk. You can come back and you can all pelt him with eggs in June of next year. Right for your eggs. We'll have a we'll dress appropriately. Let's have, a, let's have a post viaduct gathering here at here.
Well, we, we won't be able to get out of here anyway. So. <laughs> uh, good point. Touche. Okay, so this is, this is one of a handful of, of photos that we may have to repeat for another edition in a year or so because, of course, my repeat will no longer be germane. So are you going to do it on February 3rd when they open it up and people can walk across it? I'm, I'll be down there and actually we're planning with History Link and uh, the, uh, the DOT to go on and maybe take some pictures uh, before. I, I, I have a secret plan to get some good video cameras and, and go both ways up and down the viaduct. Because I haven't told anybody but you. And us. And now you guys. So here. Right. If I was working in a mail room just north of town to get back to the post office at Third Union, right. I had to drive along the freeway and go down and get off there. You couldn't motor down the streets. Uh, something like that. That's right, Rhonda. You worked in the post office. That's right. Well, I'm going to call your attention to. A building we've seen before when we looked from Smith Tower, but here is the uh, mark it's called, and now it's the F5 building. This was taken just a few months before they finished the top of it, and you can see it's under finished construction here. But what we discovered was, which I think is quite lovely, is that it was actually the architect created it because he had a passionate love of Audrey Hepburn. I, to, to build an entire hundred million dollar structure based on one photograph from Breakfast at Tiffany's, watch as Audrey stands in this next photograph, and this is love. Look at the line of her cigarette holder. And look at the line. So, he proclaimed this, he, he, he always loved this photo, he, he loved the ankles in Audrey Hepburn's hips, and arms and, and uh, so he decided to build a building and, and, uh, and the inspiration was happening. Isn't that the objectification of women? I suppose. Literally. Literally, yeah. <laughs> Making a woman into an object. So here we are north of Seattle. Ashley Curtis took this photo in 1903. It's two of three um, uh, panoramas stitched together. And I went back late last year and took a repeat. And of course, you can't see Green Lake now. You can only see the Olympics. Is this the last one on the show? No, there's a couple more. We'll finish soon. No, no, it's not quite the last one. I was wondering if you could uh, tell us uh, technically how do you relocate a Bridger Now picture? You have a, a before picture which, uh, which seems to be. So we can look at real estate maps. If you look at this photo, for example, we can pretty precisely chart the location of most of those structures on the old real estate maps. Collecting other photographs. So we have a large uh, archive of old photographs to refer to. And there's a lot of them online we don't have as prints that like aerials and uh, bird size and uh, tax photos. There's a lot of uh, a lot of help in the, in, you know, from different sources. You know. But we're still stumped, not, you know, often enough, but when we're really stumped, we just don't do it. Well, I recently saw a segment on TV where you were visited in your house and Yeah, please home. forget that. Please forget that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have a chance to vacuum at all. <laughs> It was a mess, is what it was. <laughs> was it amazing to you? Uh -huh. At that 
that's the power of language because he kept repeating about how awestruck he was by it. And then you were appropriately to his authority, awestruck yourself. I'm telling you, it's a mess. <laughs> no, I, I, I have to be contrary here because I walk into Paul's basement and to me, it is a temple. It is, an, it is a temple. A temple of history and, and propinquity. Okay, thank you, Paul. That's the fiction we tell. So, you know, in, very quickly, we, we have lots of resources to look at and old maps and some very helpful people. And you'll see one of them in just a moment coming to the end here. Because as we go forward, first of all, let us commemorate uh, right now the a house that I'm assuming most of you know. And it is, of course, the oldest structure in Seattle. Clay, add it. Go ahead, say it. You know, you want to. Well, it's, all the structure is still standing. <laughs> and again, I never understood what your point was to say you're still standing. Okay, because, okay, it's because of the ambiguity. You say the oldest structure in Seattle, you could be referring historically or presently, and so I'm just trying to nail it down. Every structure that was ever put up in Seattle was at one moment at least the oldest structure in Seattle. Absolutely. <laughs> Well, this is the oldest structure still standing, and it's in your neck of the woods. It stands on 64th, right up, up, up about, off of Alkine. And of course, it is uh, the house that Doc Mander built. And uh, it is unmarked. There's, no, uh, there's a plaque in the street, which we'll look at in a second. But Paul got this picture from uh, another special Seattle light. Well, he's been asking me that. And that is Mr. Ivor Hagman, who was, uh, whose mother was uh, the daughter of John and Hansen, Anna Hansen, who purchased the house, not actually directly from Maynard, but from, the, from someone who owned it a very short time after Maynard sold it to them. Okay? So we're correcting that. I mean, I feel guilty about it already. Uh, but anyway, so that family in 1969, wanting to move up <coughs> from California where they had settled in the uh, in, in a country north of San Francisco which was called the uh, Lake Country. I think it still is, but it was deceptively dry. So they weren't very good at agriculture there and they came up to Puget Sound. And neither was Doc Maynard very good at agriculture because he traded 260 acres downtown for 320 acres in West Seattle and started his farm. Yeah. He nearly starved to death. He, 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 uh, that was in Murray Morgan's book. Yeah, he wrote a book called Skid Road, and he wrote about wrote extensively about how much uh, Doc Maynard and the other settlers, Bourne and Danny, really didn't get along very well because they thought of Maynard as someone who cared in, in any fashion about the native peoples who were here. So. Maynard's house, and let's look at it today, and there were some members of the Southwest Seattle Historical Society who gathered to take a photo. And actually, Clay went back and tells me that they put a porch on this house, so they've done something nice to it. It looks much nicer now than it did a year ago. And, but we look at it, and there's no plaque on the ground, there's nothing that tells us that, of its significance, except down the street, where it originally stood, closer to the waterfront, there's just, there is this. But it doesn't tell us the address, and it doesn't give us a photo. So unless you're in the know, you don't know which house it is that's hiding, nestled in amongst the others. Okay, Gene and I have an opportunity to complain. Mm -hmm. But we've got to thank, be thankful for that. But we also can point our finger at this guy, who was in charge of West Seattle Heritage, really, for years. Why the heck didn't he put a poster on that? Because, yeah, private property, could that be a reason? They didn't want him to. He tried. He would sneak out in the dead of night. He'd put a little, little uh, insignia on the house. He had a plaque. And every morning he'd come back and be ripped off. You should apologize. So here we are now. We're coming to the end at last of our show. And this, of course, is Kiki Soplu, daughter of Chief Seattle, who uh, lived somewhere below 
Western and the Pike Place Market, what is now the Pike Place Market. But we didn't know exactly where. Uh, Paul, about 100 years ago, uh, was assembled a collection of photos which might provide some clues, triangulating using those old maps and those old uh, photos of eaves and houses and stumps. And, but only last year did Ron Edge, our friend and collaborator, actually really interrogate these photos and go and triangulate and find and come pretty close to the spot where Princess Angeline's what, what are you going to complain about now? I don't want to get into that. No, everyone wants to hear it. What is it? What is it? I'm waiting for a, my lunch, you know. Come on. So Ron, Ron uh, using many of these photos that Paul collected over years before, did the, the, the work of wandering around and finding the spot. And what I love about this, we put Ron on the porch, and it's the only stretch of open air between Western and the waterfront. Let's take a look at it. Except for the hill block. Uh, which is on the other side of the building on the right. Right, well there's the hill climb, but there's, this is, this is so wild open air. This is dirt. These are plants. The hill climb is a, is a bunch of concrete going up the, up the steps there. So is that part of the property? Because there's those little mm -hmm. chairs I don't know who owns this property. I don't think it's private there. I really love to have that free property. And they have little uh, elbows out of their apartments. And they go out there and sit there and enjoy it. So to the right is the fixed Medora building. And actually, the way we got in was through someone's doorway that opens out onto the little the terrace there. And they allowed us access because it's all gated below and above. You can't get there from above. So on the right hand, on the left hand side is the Pike Place Market Garage. But you can look down, if you walk down between the garage and the fixed Maduro building, you can see this stretch of greenery below you, which is all bamboo. And you can kind of peer through the bamboo and you're looking down over uh, 50, 60 feet below, over uh, Tiki So Blue's shack. Or you could go eat at Lowell's Market up in the upper floors and look down and it's right down below yeah, you. Yeah, that's true. And this is not, but you're going to see him, Ken Workman, here okay. in just a second. Our next photo is of our next photo is of Kiki Soglu sitting in what is now the market, in what is now Post Alley, and behind her is First Avenue, and we've inset a picture of Chief Seattle, and uh, we're going to go now to our repeat which does include two descendants of Chief Seattle. One is Mary Lou Slaughter, who is a great-great-great-great-granddaughter of Kiki Soglu, and Ken Workman, who is a great-great-great-great-grandson of Chief Seattle from his second wife. And so the two of them, and, and uh, uh, Mary Lou came out from Port Orchard, and Ken from North Bend, to take part in the photo. And Mary Lou is an uh, immensely accomplished uh, cedar worker, basket weaver, and she made the, the shawls that they're, they're both sporting here. She designed the uh, pattern on the floor after the basket. Yes, and you can see these. And, and uh, Mary, knew, Mary Lou knows this place well, and, and obviously Ken does as well. And they are, um, so they're sitting pretty close to the spot, and but one thing to know about Mary Lou is she's 80 years old, another 80-year-old. We have three in this show, and I think she looks pretty magnificent, <laughs> as does Ken. I mean, he's kind of the, he has that George Clooney thing going on. But these are the... Now, you say the second marriage, do they have a license? Uh, but you, 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 really wanna, you really want to get into this. Well, you were getting into it yesterday and the day before. Oh, well, we're just going to have to leave it behind. This is the end of the show. We can talk about it afterwards. Marriages. Yeah. It's a difficult, you know, it's a subject that we, sh we probably shouldn't even bring up the word marriage. Okay. So we go forward now. 
And the very end is subject to a, a little disagreement between Paul and me and Clay and many audiences. So let's see which side you fall on. So Ken is sitting, having this photo taken. He's kneeling down. And I'm going to show a picture that Clay took of me taking a picture of the two of them. And as Ken was standing there, and they're wearing the, the cedar hats, which are glorious, but we had to take them off because the shadows were, were not right for the photo. So Ken turned around a couple of times and, and later, and, and was a little bit disturbed as we were taking this picture. And later, we were sitting down in Ivar's, and, and I said, what were you looking at, Ken? Why were you flipping around? And he said, oh, well, I thought for a moment someone was trying to pick my pocket. And I said, really? He said, yeah, because I kept getting tapped on the arm. Someone was tapping him on the elbow, he said. And Paul thinks I'm indulging in phony spiritualism, but I call it at you least what I think, and the nudge you of history. Okay, now, take over, Paul. Tell us that we're all wrong. Well, thanks. Let's thank uh, Gene a lot for a wonderful show. And uh, he's the guy, actually, who's responsible. and chose these stories to put in the book, took all the contemporary shots, uh, persuaded me to, what did I do for the book? Did I say? Well, Paul did all the original columns and we used them all, so uh, we thank Paul in particular for his nearly 40 years of service to the community in creating uh, a bedrock for history and, okay, a hundred years of service <laughs> to the community and creating this bedrock of uh, popular history that Seattle has above and beyond almost every other city in the country. And I'm looking for a temporary uh, archive for the archive. So if anybody knows uh, a place that can be used next year to move all my stuff while it's being divided up into two parts, one to go to the University of Washington, the other to go to the Seattle Public Library, let me know. Right. Gene, well, thank you all so Gene, much for coming. Can I yeah. take some West Seattle Ferrari? You bet. The last we, were, we never really uh, formally or properly introduced these two guys. And some of you know me. I've been around in West Seattle for decades. And it's been truly an honor and a privilege to work with them. I'm the editor of the book, and I wrote the introduction of the book. And to be attached at the hip to these guys in, in the recent months has been Truly amazing. Thank you all for coming. I don't see Cindy Williams here in the house. She was in and out. She's probably out there. And what I would like you to do is to uh, give, a, give her a round of applause that she can hear out there for contributing this fine venue for us today. So thank you very much. And thank you to Paul and Gene. And what we'll do, we have a limited number of books that are for sale. Gene, do you want to talk about how this is going to go? Well, anyway, you'll, you'll be able to line up here and get Gene and Paul to sign it, but you've got to pay me first. <laughs> so here's the deal. First of all, let's find out um, if you would like a book. Again, we have one more event tomorrow night with about 150 people attending in, in Wallingford. And so we're sort of up against the wall. Here's our problem. We're in the middle of a trade war with China, as we discovered to our chagrin last summer. And the boat that was coming very slowly from Shanghai, Shanghai was supposed to arrive in, well, no, it was Shanghai, it was supposed to arrive in mid-October. And uh, it, it took an extra month to get here. It arrived on Friday. Now it's in the, gen the gentle hands of U.S. Customs and their drug-sniffing dogs. So we are waiting for nearly 5,000 copies to be offloaded. Right now we have about 25 copies left and we're gonna, we're gonna set aside a few here. Um, we will also give you an order form if, you, if we run out of books here, because we have to save some for tomorrow night. We'll do the same for them tomorrow night. But the order form, you don't even need the order form. You can also Who go online. Who is the guy at the end of the table? Paul Dorpat. Just go to pauldorpat.com 
You can order it online. You can tell how you want these guys to inscribe it, and you'll get it in the mail exactly the way that you want it as soon as we get the books, which is within a week. 